I'm totally afraid. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of losing. I'm afraid of being humiliated. But I'm totally confident. The closer I get to the ring, the more confident I get. The closer, the more confident. The new definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. My confidence comes from both my faith and in the fact that I keep promises I make to myself. Feel com Borrow confidence from the past. Confidence. 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 You should ring up. Welcome, Mr. Gopi Chand. Yes, Gopi, Welcome, thank Gopi. you very much. Ganapati. Hi, Gopi. Hi, Gopi. Hi. Uh, may I introduce you to Mr. R. Ganapati, who is the president of the South Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Hi, 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 Gopi. It's an honor and privilege for Sikki to have you with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Right. And also, Sanjay Bandari of uh, Mitra and Mitra is with us also. So, Dr. Raghavan, who is the Secretary General of the Chamber. Good evening, Gopi. It's uh, yes. welcome, and we have been hearing a lot about you. Uh, it's a pleasure that we are going to see you at such close quarters. So we are waiting to listen to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, Doctor, I think uh, we should be good to start. Yeah. Six. Doctor, start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are starting the day two uh, with one of the uh, icon of uh, India's sports, uh, Mr. Kulela Gobichand, Chief National Coach, Indian Badminton Team, and a former All India, uh, All England champion. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, the Stalbas, and uh, this event is being uh, uh, sponsored by CCT. And Mitra is the knowledge partner. I request Mr. Ganapati, the president of Southern India Chamber and the chairman of the Trijan Group, to kindly deliver the formal welcome address, please. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a high privilege and honor for Sikhi to have Mr. Gopi Chan uh, with us today to discuss and debate and understand how sports would structure itself and showcase going forward post COVID-19. If you are to list some of the top things that one missed, apart from, of course, going to work during the last three months, top of the list would be sports. People were so used to watching live sports. Today, television shows only sports of the past, although many of them recall can capture some uh, uh, defining moments like somebody winning the All India uh, All England Championship in 2001 or going on to pick up a Padma Bhushan in the Rashtrapati Bhavan for his events. But I think nothing like having live sport, but that is going to change going forward. And in fact, uh, this is the time of the uh, season in India when we get ready for IPL and for a 4 p.m. and an 8 p.m. start and we have the best of uh, sports uh, cricket in our uh, drawing room. But today, everything has changed. But then look at it differently. Sports is a great uniter. Sportsmen unite a nation like India even more. And sporting legends unite the best. And one such legend, ladies and gentlemen, is with us today, Pulela Gopichand, who, apart from being a legend himself and carrying the burden of a billion people's aspiration on his shoulders, has ensured that legends are produced eternally in this country and cater to the aspirations of a nation for whom sports is the first and perhaps the uppermost religion. Talking to this legend is another legend, a brother like to me, a TV and media journalist, T.S. Sudhir. And of course, we have with us uh, our knowledge partners, Mitra. And I'm really surprised for the kind of support they could give us in terms of knowledge sharing on this program. Because knowing the promoters as I do, I realized sports and they were alien. Yet they were able to put this together and hats off to Mitra. And with these openers, opening statement, let me hand over proceedings to 
the one and only T.S. Sudhir talking to the one and only Pulela Gopichan. Thanks, folks. Stay safe and have a great con witness a great conversation. Thank you so much. Over to you, T.S. Thank you very much, Mr. Ganapati. Uh, of course, uh, sports is one thing, but today's sports, world sports in particular, is also about a lot of money. Uh, so, talking uh, briefly about Pulela Gopichan, I've known Gopichan for well over two decades now, and I consider him one of the most articulate voices in world sports today, easily, uh, without a doubt. Uh, and also, I must admit that whenever the chips are down or when one is navigating through a crisis of some sort, Gopi's life is something which I've always looked upon, looked at with as an inspiration. To come back from an injury in the mid 90s, which was almost threatening his career as a badminton player, and then go on to win the All England Championship in 2001, showed essentially one thing that hard work and talent, of course, is important. But essentially, at the end of the day, the determination to succeed is what the stuff champions are made of. And in my uh, view, Gopichand is up there as a champion. I've written about it in a lot of times in many of my articles that Gopichand, many of many people say he runs a training school, the academy, the Gopulela Gopichand Academy in Gachibol area in Hyderabad. But according to me, he runs basically a conveyor belt, a conveyor belt of sorts where champions are churned out with such regularity. I mean, you name the top badminton players in the country, they all have one thing in common. They're all products of the Gopichand Academy. Uh, the lockdown period, uh, for those of you who may not be knowing this, has been quite eventful for Gopi Chan because he spent 14 days in quarantine twice. 14 plus 14. Uh, once, I think, when he came back from abroad and second, when he went to Andhra Pradesh and came back and again spent 14 days in quarantine in Hyderabad. Uh, as part of this discussion, and we are really privileged to have Gopi as a speaker today, uh, he'll make his introductory remarks, uh, speak about what kind of sport will be there, the sporting culture in a corona world, given the fact that this was to be an Olympics year, uh, this would have been the time when Gopi would have been kind of doing the last minute preparation for Tokyo. That is, of course, not to be now. After which, we'll throw the floor open for questions and answers. So please send in your questions, and I'm sure Gopi would be the best place to answer many of your queries regarding world sports in general. Gopi, your mic is live. We'd love to listen to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Sudeep. I think uh, it's really nice to be here. And uh, thank you to Mr. Ganpati and Mr. Raghavan for the nice introduction. And thank you very much. Uh, and a very good evening to all of you. Um, well, I think, uh, I don't know how people would view what I'm saying, but um, people have been talking about live sport, people have been talking about Olympic sport and how it impacts. And a lot of talk has been about um, the high level performance sport. I think like in our society, uh, people who have in the middle class who probably um, saved a bit of money or the rich people. It's okay to actually go through this last few days comfortably. But as the migrant workers are, there is a huge population also in the country, in the unorganized sector, who are the coaches and who are the people who are the markers, who are people who are supplying small equipment and who depend on sport and small scale sport players who do not play the IPL because we might tell that the IPL will be a loss. Yes, it will be a loss to the big players who earn crores of rupees. But I think to the domestic players who are probably just starting off on the Ranji Trophy. And there's a lot of players who are going to lose money there. There's a lot of players and coaches in various other sports who are in grassroots levels who for, for a coach who works in a swimming pool, the marker who works, they're the person who's stringing rackets, the person who's selling small balls, cricket balls uh, in the summer. I think there's a lot of uh, disadvantage for those people in sport today. I think that's a big area of sport which is actually suffering because of the COVID lockdown. Yes, I think uh, sport is a non-essential item. But among all the non-essential items, it is the most important one. 
I think for all of us, and uh, Mr. Ganpati had uh, rightly put it, I think uh, if during this time there was sport and live sport, at least there would have been something to look forward to. And uh, that's something which I really miss. Going forward, um, sport is going to be different. Um, I hope uh, we are able to continue live sport without spectators also is fine. But I think we have to make changes because in a world where travel might not be the same again, where gatherings might not be the same, I think the people who are ad going to adapt fast and be are seen as being safe and are seen as using other platforms to market themselves are going to be important. And uh, content for television, content for internet is going to be very, very important in the future. And also a very important thing in the COVID time was actually showed us health is important. Immunity is important. Small exercise done at home is important. It's going to change the way people look at sport as well. And I think we need to be very clear that for all of us, sport is much more important than the medals which it brings. It is much more important because today, more than ever, I think people need to find ways to entertain themselves and feel the body and the mind together. And that is sport. I think we need sport for that reason. We need children to play sport for that reason. And we need probably a rethink on the way we look at leagues, we think look at travel. Uh, a simple example would be that we would play, say, internationally. We would travel almost 17 to 20 tournaments in a year, each one in a different country. So literally, we are spending 20 weeks traveling from country to country. Can that be curtailed as something we need to look at from our sport? We would have a sub-junior event in um, Hyderabad, which would draw about 2,500 people from across the country coming to participate with parents or guardians or coaches. And that would mean a huge amount of travel. We need to relook at how we manage that. I think in general, we would have tournaments um, with different levels of play, people just gathering together. I think how can we isolate that and ensure that smaller and smaller groups play so that a Kerala guy need not go to Bihar, a Mizoram guy doesn't need to come to Gujarat, and how this whole process can be simplified is very, very important. So I come back to this question. COVID times difficult for international sport, for people who've uh, trained all their lives thinking the Olympics is important. I think to get postponed might be bad news for some. It might actually be good news for others who haven't prepared enough. Maybe one year later could actually be, they could be stronger coming back. So that's something which is important. But I think it's also very important what happens to kids because people who have spent four or five years in sport already and who are 13 and 14 suddenly find, is it worth what we are doing? That's a big question mark. People who think that this is my profession, I'll be the sub-junior national champion this year and suddenly the nationals doesn't happen. What happens to us as a player, the parents are disillusioned. People who have resigned jobs and thought that I will get a coach's job and a secure income and who have taken EMIs and bought a car and a house, how do they pay back and get back? Because the lockdown, if it continues beyond a point, is going to hurt them. And it hurts the confidence. And how are we going to take that forward? Swimming pools. People have invested in pools, taken loans. People have invested in stadiums, taken loans. And suddenly if they're out, and summers typically would have been the time where they earn enough for the rest of the year, and they are closed, what happens to them? I think it has impacted us badly. 
and um, the surface is the Olympics and the IPLs, but actually the real pain is down below. And with young kids who are 18 and 19 who think that this is their time to make it, they lose a year and it's a short career of eight to 10 years. You don't know, the progression might not happen at all. People can lose track because new habits come in and suddenly after a few months, they might never progress the way they've done. So it's very important that they are taken care of. People who are 28 and 29, one year break might just push them out into retirement. So there are every aspect of it, which is very, very important. So yes, life is important. Health is important. So we cannot complain as much, but when you look deeper, uh, there is pain and uh, these are tough times. So it's important to innovate. It's important to try new things and it's important to stay positive. With these words, uh, Sudhir, um, right. I'll just hand it over to you to start. Yes. I must admire you, Gopi, for actually uh, starting with something which really shows that you have your heart in the right place. Uh, you know, sports we associate with a lot of glamour, the big names in sports. But I really admire you for pointing out the marker, the person who sells the cricket balls outside the stadium, the person who must have taken loans in order to operate a swimming pool or perhaps a gym and they would be doing well idly this summer, which they haven't. So uh, I do understand the point, the larger point that you are making that sports is when we speak about big money in sports, there's also a lot of this, a lot of these kind of people who have been very badly adversely affected as a result of the lockdown, the COVID pandemic. Uh, my first question, you spoke about spectators uh, or the lack of spectators. How much would that be a factor for you as a player, coach, when you are playing in an absolutely empty stadium, does that make any difference whether there is there are spectators, whether there is a crowd or there is no crowd at all? Uh, I think each player would think differently. For me personally, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, but um, I'm sure there will be players for whom it makes a difference. And I think uh, today, especially with sports like badminton, I'm sure um, IPL or whether it's uh, football leagues actually have a lot of uh, get collections, which actually are a substantial part of their revenues. But hmm. the on ground, on the court, in the stadium numbers and the money which is spent or earned from them doesn't really make so much of a difference for an Indian uh, context of, or a, for a badminton context also. It's, it's kind of a minor part of it because most sports sells on television and that would be still the important thing. The excitement of live sport is definitely there. I think that you cannot beat that part of it. And the economics behind people coming to the stadium and watching whether they book hotels and they go in cars and they go to a restaurant, all that economics aside, I think from an event perspective, I think uh, for the organizers of the event, uh, especially sports which are not as popular as a cricket or a, a football, I think we should be okay to take that uh, meeting. And... Um, some people thrive when there are people watching and uh, they are uh, fans around. Uh, the atmosphere is electric. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure yes. uh, in due course, and that's very quickly, players will get adapted. Right. Uh, last night when you were speaking, and this is one of the points that you have made, is about how to kind of cut short the 17 to 20 weeks of traveling that the badminton players do from all over the world. Is there a formula by which you can kind of, as you said, have the tournaments being played at one single uh, place, as you mentioned, the Indonesian, Singapore and the Malaysian Open taking place at one venue, at one stadium, so that you can take care 
of the health factor of the athletes i think one of the things which i have suggested and uh, was um, and probably a difficult suggestion from a world uh, badminton perspective from their commercial viewpoint mm. uh, but i think uh, when you look at it uh, you go from a country to country we might actually end up being quarantined and that's the reality um we don't know if players are safe that's also what we need to take care of so my suggestion was that instead of playing indonesia malaysia singapore three back to back tournaments traveling almost the same group was playing against each other for three weeks instead of going to three different stadiums in three different countries and running the risk of everybody getting infected Mm-hmm. might as well just stay locked down in one place mm-hmm. and play four weeks in a row mm-hmm. and go back home and then mm-hmm. come back after six weeks to another venue and then play again four weeks in a row so what essentially we i'm suggesting is that if there are no spectators how does it matter whether you are in indonesia or singapore or malaysia or delhi so it doesn't make any difference so why should we as players be risking ourselves and also why should the entire population be risked because mm-hmm. of this kind of travel mm-hmm. so i think that's something which we need to look at even domestically that's the same formula i would think we should have lot more local competitions which are very clearly marked out mm-hmm. there the two players who come in play against each other with one umpire who comes watches their matches notes down puts it on the net and then that locally when this competition finishes you pick the best of the lot and a select group of zonal guys who probably if india were to be divided into six or eight zones mm-hmm. you get three three or four four people mm-hmm. from each zone get them to a place make them play back to back three or four tournaments in two to three weeks and then send them back instead of having 2500 people coming into a venue you are effectively breaking it down to a 60 or a 50 number so that things are much more easily manageable given given the fact uh, gopi that there are this commercial considerations how has the badminton world federation reacted to the suggestion of yours and point number to a related point how are the players themselves reacting is there a sense of fear apprehension concern paranoia if i may use the word among players as to what could possibly happen well it's players psyches and mentalities um sometimes um are very brave um they just don't see things um very clearly in the sense when i had an option to talk to the players about the all england i remember the players who had a chance to qualify said we want to go because mm-hmm. they had a chance to qualify to the olympics yes the rest of them backed off so it's almost like players interest supersedes logic at some point of time because the same player is deciding if i have a chance i will play if i don't have a chance i will be draw kind of a thing so i think um, at the moment uh, also it's the same um, i think players mm. are um mm. are scared and i don't know how this whole issue is going to be res- resolved mm. because if at when england was at 1000 cases we stopped the next tournament in swiss was about swiss swiss was about uh, 300 odd cases yes. we didn't play the swiss open but today when there is a lack of people affected or 30000 people affected in a small country we are going yes. there and playing and the risk of them contracting the virus is much more than what we what has happened in march so when you stop events in march what makes you open up up in august because we don't have a vaccine we don't have a cure you don't have a full proof mechanism so what is stopping yes is my my big question so players are apprehensive so the players especially um, 
parents and especially with in india the decision is a family decision so parents are apprehensive yes. and most of them are like better not take a chance kind of words but with some of the players who are olympic bound it's almost like a once in a lifetime chance mm. so they want to be careful and right. want to take a chance right and um, my, my, the first part of my question i mean has the world badminton federation responded to your suggestion of having this three four tournaments at one venue itself yeah so thomas lund who is the secretary general said it was an interesting one but they have commercial uh, issues with going that route so basically it means mm-hmm. that you have committed to the sponsors of a particular format and uh, if you change the format mm-hmm. we made through it's going to be difficult if uh, and i agree totally with that in the sense you've gone to indonesian open and told them that you have men singles women singles men doubles and suddenly mm-hmm. if you end up getting only a doubles event and uh, they might not be interested so so i think uh, they have these issues so if you could conduct these events and everything is fine mm-hmm. in august it's great but if not then we have to have a plan which is at least gives us a clear chance to be safe right uh, at least in badminton there is no it's not a contact sport but do you see much more of a concern and apprehension in sports like say uh, wrestling boxing for instance what happens to those sports where they which are really contact sport well i think uh, uh, it is definitely a risk and uh, today we might open but three four cases might just go back into a knee jerk reaction which might mm-hmm. um pull us back a few more steps mm-hmm. so i yes. think unless we figure out quarantine spaces mm-hmm. quarantine mm-hmm. um time and lockdown mm-hmm. at least to those people who are competing against each other we are always going to mm-hmm. be at risk so i think it's important to strategize in a way that if the top 30 players are competing against each other you bring them together 14 days in advance get the testing done and then they compete that's the only way i see how things are going to be uh, going forward now uh, the coaches and the players work according to a particular regimen which includes the diet regimen and also the fitness regimen and the manner in which they train in order to peak uh, uh, ahead or during a particular tournament and all of you must have had the tokyo olympics in mind mr ashok krishnamurthy wants to know how long does it take for professional sports persons to become match fit after two months of activity i mean how do they kind of get back into the groove because obviously the kind of uh, stuff they must be doing at home in a limited space is obviously not good enough i think for most athletes um who have played a decent level uh injuries have been a part so they would know how to handle their body and mind um for a month or two so it's not really so much of a problem um you might be a bit rusty and that's an individual case where some players might need a few more matches to come back few players might need a few lesser matches that's an individual aspect but uh to be specific i would think a six week uh preparation time would be good enough to get back but how well you get back depends on player to player but from a game perspective i think um 6 weeks because i'm sure and i know each one of them on the badminton circuit have been working uh, at least 10 sessions to 12 sessions 10 to 11 sessions a week uh, even on the lockdown and uh, they've been maintaining uh, those fitnesses so 6 to 8 weeks max is what i would believe uh, is enough okay given the fact that the tokyo olympics has been postponed to next year as of now what would be the game plan and i have speak not just about badminton but about all the olympic sports what do you see the road map ahead should be or is it too too, uh, too early to even speculate about what kind of a road map should be for india ahead of the tokyo olympics next year i think each sport is different if you were to pick badminton uh, as a specific example mm. i would believe uh, that uh we would um need to be reasonably fit uh, mm. by jan and um and the next few months we need to progress to peak mm. by the olympics in july mm. so i think um, there is enough time as of now so there's mm. no concern as such 
So basic point would be that ensure that you have your qualification done wrapped up and you don't overstress yourself. Because one of the things which is important to understand mm. is that um, when athletes train hard mm. and they push themselves, immunity goes down beyond a point. So you don't want people push themselves mm. uh, prematurely because mm. then the risk of contracting mm. uh, an infection is much more. Mm -hmm. So you want to very gradually progress on this path. So you want to be careful and uh, take notice of that as well. Right. Uh, you mentioned about players being used to injuries. Mr. Ravichandra Babu has just now sent a question as to if a player was affected by COVID, by the coronavirus, and if he wants to kind of stage a comeback, how much of a challenge would that be? I think it's okay. Um, uh, the way I look at it once is because I think um, we've had players come back from, and in India's, uh, we, we've had this challenge in the world. Mm. Uh, we mm. in India mm. uh, every year have all the mm. players suffering a bout of cold or a cough or mm. flu. Or uh, on last time we had a couple of unfortunate instances where mm. Pronoy had uh, dengue. Uh, we had uh, Ashwini Punapa had um, chicken gunia once. So mm. actually, when you have these things, you actually lose quite a bit of time. So and then people do come back. And mm. uh, COVID, depending on your own. Um, resistance and your comeback time uh, mm. I think uh, I, I think people will come back quickly is what my feeling is it's not and I don't know enough about uh, the recovery mm. process and mm. how much it affects uh, mm. the body uh, as much as I would know for say a dengue or a uh, malaria mm. or something mm. but I'm sure people would come back quickly Gopi, you have been a uh, great advocate of physical literacy about how there needs to be an emphasis on being physically fit right from a very young age. Now, what is happening during the lockdown is that people are obviously not getting the space, uh, even though they have the time, not the space to exercise. Now, what kind of a negative impact does it have on the entire ethos of physical literacy in India? I think today more than ever, it's supremely important that people invest in physical activity. Mm -hmm. And I think we've taken this too lightly for too long. Mm -hmm. And the reason for playing sport should not be medals alone. Mm -hmm. If medals happen, that's fantastic. But I think the bottom line is people should invest mm -hmm. time, money, everything possible society should invest and people should be encouraged to participate in physical activity because it helps build immunity. It helps in mental fitness because at times like these, it's not only the physical health, but yes. the mental issues which are huge. And unless you engage with the body in something which is challenging, something which is fun, there's something which makes you forget about your mind, I think it's going to be impossible. And how else can we do it other than, mm. say, music or dance or, or sport or even yoga and simple stuff of, say, even a six by six space at home where you can actually move around and you can still do things. So I think physical literacy talks about a few things. And the first of it is motivation. And I think that is very important. The other aspect is knowledge and understanding. And I think that's very important mm. to be smart enough to understand your body and to know enough mm. of what you can do with the body in a limited space. I think that is very important. So especially in these times, I would say it's supremely important that people invest in those things. And especially for kids, because the next generation is not going to be as fit as we are. So I think it's very important mm. that we start to push them on the physical mm. side. Right. In fact, I must say Gopi Chand is uh, someone everyone should emulate as far as fitness goes. Very, very fit uh, and I've always admired him for that. Mr. N.T. Ra N.T. Rao uh, from the World Peace University team Pune has this question to ask. What do educators need to do to produce champions in sports without compromising academics to a great extent? Uh, we have always seen that anyone who comes on a sports quota admission is always kind of looked down upon. Do you think that attitude needs to change or what can be done in order to kind of balance both academics and sports? 
Well, I think um, it's a question I think which has uh, which we need to understand uh, comes from a very thought process that education mm. is important and sport mm. is not end of a feeling. Mm. I think um, we need to start questioning those things. When you are say twenty five years of age, and till the next seventy five years of your age, what are the things which are going to be useful? Which you have learnt in school, or what is it that you have learnt in childhood, which is going to be important? And if you look mm-hmm. at that, I think the experiences which you have had in sport, mm-hmm. the knowledge which you have understanding sport, and the motivation which you draw from the early childhood experiences to ensure that you continue this journey for life, is what will give you a body which is healthy, experiences which is wholesome. and also be a better human being so life skills and stuff so i think it's it's fine might sound strange and um, my apologies for saying this i think we've been piggy bagging on education for too long the value of sport is much beyond marks and i think we it's time we looked at sport differently it's time we started thinking about sport differently because this gives you real value mm. i don't know how much of calculus and trigonometry and and history and geography does but this gives you value for life mm. so i think this is supremely important and no 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 disrespect to the other subjects but i think this is a key subject and i don't want to put this statement here saying that if you play sport you will get better marks so play sport no i think this is more important than marks mm. and it's time that we kind of invest mm. in sport for sport itself and i think for the lessons it gives for life for becoming a better human being and for happiness and health and community mm. i think sport is supremely important right uh, very well said uh, the other longer question is of corporate sponsorships because the commercial backing obviously very important for sports at any level from the sub junior to the international level the question being asked is uh, when it comes to csr and sponsorships sports is not really seen as a big priority unless they are backing the big players who already made a mark for themselves at the international level what's your take on it and especially in covid times do you see that taking a bit of a hit i think for the long, longest period of time uh, the academy had really struggled for sponsors to be fair i think we really struggled and uh, and we had very few people coming forward to su- support it i had n prasad who came very initially and thanks to him we were able to push um, yes. building the academy uh, later um, we only in the last 3 or 4 years whether it's idbi federal or whether it's kotak bank uh, we've kind of people have started believing and actually supporting sport but having said that Uh, and I, I remember um, going to CSR uh, before for sponsorship, and they would say um, we don't have sport on the list of CSR, and they would say it is mostly girl, child, health, sanitation, education. Uh, sorry, sport is not on CSR. So then they would put me on to the sponsorship guys, and the sponsor would get and say, "Boss, you don't have as a sport. Badminton doesn't have the eyeballs to be a." world sport or billions can be champions so this is the kind of words which i got in the initial years of or for a very long time but having said that the last few years have reinforced people's belief in sport and especially in badminton and today things are a lot different but also it's it's important to mention that government and the sports authority of india and corporate india and also parents are looking at sport very different from what mm-hmm. they have looked at say before 2009 2008 i think we have really changed into a sporting nation uh, or we are moving towards that um, pretty pretty well uh, with a country which has less resources i know it's going to be much more difficult but i am saying i see very positive things happening from every quarter so today 
yes we still do struggle big time but from the struggles which i i have seen in 2004 till now uh, i think uh, mm. the future looks very good because government has mm. uh, kelo india as as a major initiative it has fit india yes. as a major initiative and many many kids are getting scholarships uh, in those projects right they are getting scholarships but in the present environment when there is a bit of a question mark over okay i have chosen this sport does the sport have a future in a covid 19 world do you see given the fact that as you said these kind of decisions are taken by the entire family do you see a situation where many uh, 13 year olds 14 year olds may decide that okay this is too risky let me go back to a more risk free academic professional kind of a career do you see that happening yeah i, I can't deny the fact that um, uh, the covid scenario has put doubts on people's minds uh, but i don't know how many fields are risk free and mm. um today i think to have life skills which helps you navigate through life would be more important and for that reason i am the covid scenario makes me even more bullish and to want to shout louder to say in this times what sport can teach you nothing else can and for that reason you need to play sport even if you're a mm-hmm. failure in sport just to learn about failure you need to play sport and and to kind of adapt to new conditions you need to play sport so the value of sport is immense and let's not look at it in the organized sector or the unorganized sector as a job will he get here mm-hmm. here but wherever he gets in life i think sport is mm-hmm. going to be useful so i would really say invest in mm-hmm. sport is the best thing you can do today right uh, before i mean if the olympics were to take place this year uh, you would have been playing a lot of the big names the shrikant the saina nehwal the sindhu the sai pranit all of them would have been playing many of the big names and got used to kind of and working out the strategies given the fact that there will be a bit of a doubt and apprehension about traveling would this less competition uh, what what effect will this less competition lead to the final result at the tokyo olympics in case it takes place next year well i think for many of the senior players mm-hmm. they will come out of it without much of a problem mm-hmm. in fact it might be in a way even better because the time could rest to heal their injuries they could get to bounce back stronger they would be uh, in a position to restructure their program and have enough rest and training periods so that they peak in time for the games but for players who are young uh, who are on the path i think this could be a kind of a detriment as well so i'm uh, not uh, like they say uh, one size doesn't fit all kind of scenario so in the same way i can't say that this is a rule which is there for everybody mm-hmm. but in general mm-hmm. i would think that experienced players are uh, can mm-hmm. benefit by the lockdown mm-hmm. and by this year where we have finished about 85% of the mm-hmm. uh, qualification period so uh, only with 15% mm-hmm. left only 6 to 7 tournaments left people can mm-hmm. play those tournaments and then prepare mm-hmm. for the big event mm-hmm. uh mr lakshmana from bengaluru has this question to ask is the attention to sports i mean basically he wants to know how sports minded are we as a country and is this attention or lack of attention to sports a reason for getting fewer medals because we see every year every once in four years when india does not fare too well at the olympics uh, except in say game as sports like shooting badminton uh there's a sense of you know oh, a, uh, a country with so much of population is not able to get even 10 to 15 odd medals is that the result of a lack of a sports culture or not being sports minded enough um i wouldn't say lack of a sports culture or something i i would say things are pretty getting better hmm. but having said that olympic sports medals needs 
scientific work which is very focused and you need to know where you need to invest in um, i just want you all to just ponder on this a little bit don't think of olympic sport as something which is very fair and nice and correct and, and that kind of a thing because do we and this is a fundamental question uh, all 100 meters winners have come out of a certain gene pool which comes out of western africa all sprint winners come from there and all long distance middle distance runners comes of come out of eastern africa if that is the case then we as a country should be participate in these events fully or we should refrain from because there's no chance of us winning a medal there so i think for us the value of sport should be looked at beyond medals and that's why i go back to that statement again but if we need medals then we need to pick sports where we are good at and where our body type is good at and be very focused and invest in them with a singular minded focus to win medals and there cannot be any democracy there all sport is same uh, or uh, all players are same you just need to be singularly focused on winning medals and you have to ensure that you have you pull the right strings at the olympic federation mm. level also to ensure that sports where you are good at mm. has more medals so that's the kind of thinking you actually have to have so and i have jokingly say this mm. that um, the europeans have so many swimming pools and they end up having so much of infrastructure hands which are big and mm. legs body which is big mm. so they end up having in swimming they have a front freestyle they have a backstroke they have a butterfly they have a medley they have a breaststroke they have 50 meter 100 meter everything and so they have kind of end up having a bunch of medals where they have maximized the sport yes and if these guys were good in running if the europeans and the people who control the federations were good in running they would have made people run backwards sideways and every possible way mm-hmm. so i think it's very difficult to say that uh, olympic sports is uh, about these things so so i think it's very important to say let's put the olympic si- sport to the mm-hmm. side mm-hmm. and let's look at being the best of what we can be and as one seventh of the world's population we can be mm-hmm. bullish about which sports we support right. and let's do our own stuff Uh, gopi the times when you were playing in the 1990s and the early part of the century you didn't have so the excuse something. me i'll just put on the light a bit sure i think it's or is it too is it okay i i think i think it's looking fine but if you want to put on the light it's fine yeah it's fine then then it's fine yeah go ahead okay uh, last two questions gopi uh, no problem when you were a player in the 90s and the early part of the century you didn't have the kind of support staff that you now have uh, for the players who are playing now uh, what more do you think i mean you, i remember you used to say in earlier interviews about how you know you have a long wish list of things that badminton indian badminton needs in order to excel at the world level in 2020 what is gopi chand's wish list for indian badminton now the three things that you think indian badminton still needs and it hasn't got a system in place uh people need to know what they are accountable for hmm. and that is very important mm. um i would really love to see a structure which binds the entire country together what i mean is that there are in education you have players moving from mm. primary to high school to secondary to uh, college and phd whereas in our sport we don't have a structure of grassroots level intermediate level or elite level yes so coaches hang on to players too long uh, because we don't have a structure for motivating coaches so my wish list secondly would have this as a prime secondary goal the third thing is that we need to organize our sport in such a way that people don't keep crossing this country across playing tournaments we need to minimize the amount of travel and maximize the amount of times they play players of the same quality 
quality. And that is a structure which we need, which builds grassroots upwards. And at the top, absolute confidence, absolute accountability, and absolute discipline to ensure that the top players are producing continuous results. Right. Gopi, my last question, and I go back to my first question, uh, when you spoke about the coaches, the, the markers, the ball boys, you know, etc., who also need help, and they're also part of the entire sporting ecosystem. What do you think is uh, needs to be done in order to ensure that these people who are actually providing the entire sporting ecosystem do not get adversely affected as a result of this entire COVID pandemic? Or do you think much like the migrant workers, the guest workers, they're also the forgotten people uh, when we think of sports? I think um, in general, uh, coaches uh, across sport are a forgotten uh, identity. We don't um, we don't recognize them as much. Mm. Uh, probably somebody can say teachers also fall into that category, uh, but uh, possibly yes. Um, but I think it's very important to one acknowledge the fact that these people are part of the ecosystem, and these people are um, and in an unorganized sector, but there are a huge number of them like that. So how do we help them? So a database and a structure which ensures that they also get some minimum support during this period is very, very important. Right. Uh, Gopi, thank you very much for being part of this session, answering questions with such great clarity. Uh, as always, uh, it's been our pleasure that you were part of this session, the webinar session being hosted by called the Mitra Dialogues and being hosted by the South Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, the past president of SIKI, Mr. Jawahar Badivelu, will propose a vote of thanks. I think thank he also you. has a question. I think you should ask that question first, right, Jawahar? Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, Gopi did answer that. You know, I wanted to know, you know, what more do we need to do, you know, to uh, help make badminton you know, achieve the kind of... Uh, you know, the mass appeal that cricket unfairly enjoys in India today. And I think we we'll allude to the fact that, you know, we need to build this put up from the grassroots level and quite appropriately uh, put. And I do hope that, you know, with all the success that uh, Kopi has achieved uh, in uh, helping badminton achieve the status, you know, is just the uh, you know, the very beginning of what more we can do. And we, uh, India already uh, is is right up there in the sporting world, in especially in the badminton arena. And, um, uh, you know, we are certainly set uh, and well on our way to achieve even more glory in the badminton world. So, so that said, you know, it gives me immense pleasure in proposing a very hearty vote of thanks to uh, Mr. Pulela Gopichand, uh, the chief national coach of the Indian Badminton Federation and also a former All England uh, champion for kindly agreeing to share his thoughts with us as to how we could yet chase sporting glory uh, in uh, the Corona world that we live in today. Uh, many useful pointers and learning lessons for all of us on how important it is for us to be adaptive in order to be successful. I'd like to thank Mr. Sanna Reddy, Managing Director of Free City Private Limited and member of the Executive Committee for kindly agreeing to our request uh, to sponsor the edition of the webinar series. I also thank uh, Mr. T. S. Sudhir, uh, eminent television journalist, for anchoring this uh, webinar splendidly as he always does. And finally, you know, I request participants to kindly also join us for tomorrow evening session. Um, as you all know, tomorrow evening session is going to be held by uh, Mr. Ram Kumar Ramurthy, who is the chairman and management director of Cognizant India. Uh, so this will also be at the same time at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. 
for these few words. I thank you all very much for being part of this event. And uh, so thank you once again, uh, Gopi Chandra. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Adir, and thanks, uh, Javaji. Thank you very much, Gopi. Thanks, Thank everyone, you, thank you, thank you all very much. Today. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe, all of you. Bye. Thank you. There's a difference. I want to do it and I want to be a rock star, right? Like, and that's where you influence people. Like, you know, like I want to do it, but I also want to be the most popular. And so then that person's like, oh, I want to be him. So I guess I'll be nice. Like I want to literally take people who have DNA that's kind of nice and make them more nice.